Welcome back, critical thinkers. Our last topic before uh, exam preparing you for the second exam are the fallacies. So make sure you have the lecture titled Fallacies open and you're following along. Um, and uh, so let's begin. So what are the fallacies? Well, this is related to our, our, our current topics because we've sort of covered induction. We've covered good ways of observing the world and gathering evidence about the world to try to figure out what the facts are. We've covered basic research methodology. And then last time we covered sort of ways for induction to go, to go wrong. We covered um, eyewitness testimony as a working example of poor observation, where what we think is true about the world when we're trying to establish the facts there are some basic psychological realities, um, basic psychological processes that often prevent us from making good observations. And so today we're going to cover more sort of faulty reasoning. Um, and it's, it's going to be more global than that. The fallacies are ways of constructing arguments where you start bringing in reasons that either don't support adequately your argument Right, because remember, an argument is issue, question, reasons, which is support, and conclusion. Whether it's a research argument or whether or not it's an argument about who should do the dinner, who should do the dishes, or who should make dinner. Bottom line, an academic argument is issues, reasons, and conclusion. And so the fallacies are examples of people creating an argument, issues, reasons, and conclusion, but they don't create a very good argument, meaning they either don't fully support their conclusion, they imply a question, and then don't fully support their conclusion with their reasons, or they provide reasons that have no business being in the argument at all. They're actually not good reasons. And we call this fallacious reasoning or poor reasoning. And so now we're going to be sort of, uh, sort of returning back to our sort of um, the groundwork where we started, which is how do you construct a good argument? And what are some reasons that are not enough to support an argument? And what are some reasons that have, have no business being there? Right? And so these are the fallacies. And we're going to start with a group of fallacies, which I simply like to call inadequate, meaning they're the kind of reasons that someone might give you in an argument that are, maybe are not wholly inappropriate, meaning they might be a good way to start an argument or they might sort of kind of support a particular conclusion, but are not enough by themselves. And then we're going to cover a group of fallacies that um, have no business being in arguments, meaning they're the kind of reasons that are just inappropriate. Uh, and and this is sort of my my take on things, right? This is, uh, this is a little bit independent of your book. Um, these are the, this is sort of my grouping of these two sets of fallacies. They're all fallacious, meaning when you see these things in arguments, um, you're going to basically, they're going to cause you to suspect that this argument isn't well supported and that this person's conclusion is sort of based on faulty reasoning, uh, both groups of fallacies. But the first group are most likely to be um, unintentional. They're more likely to be stumbled upon accidentally. And you can often move from these sort of inadequate reasons, uh, which are fallacious, to better ones uh, more easily. Whereas the second group of fallacies, which I'm going to call the fallacies that actively mislead, have no business being in an argument. And um, when you see them in an argument, it's usually beca because the person is intentionally trying to mislead you in some way with fallacious thinking. And these are just in general tendencies. They're, it's not for sure that if you see a fallacy that I'm going to call a fallacy that misleads was done on purpose, but it's much more likely in my experience. So first, let's talk about what fallacies are in slide two. So fallacies are reasons that create weak arguments. It can be a complete argument, issue, reasons, and conclusion, but the argument itself is weak because the reasons themselves don't actually adequately support the conclusion. They're really, really common. And they often can make arguments sound persuasive, sound persuasive, even though they're not actually persuasive, at least to someone who's not um, on the lookout for them, to what's called the casual listener. If you're not on the lookout for these sort of um, errors of reasoning, um, you often won't 
pay attention and maybe might be persuaded to think the person has a good argument and reality it's just fallacious fallacious is sort of the adjective for a fallacy which is um, the noun right so that's the idea so uh, fallacies are common they sound good but they're not they're really common in politics they're common in advertising um, and sometimes they're very hard to detect which is why as a tool in your toolbox as a critical thinker I want to teach you about some really common fallacies we're not going to learn about them all certainly not but we're going to learn about some of the most common um, as a tool in your toolbox as a critical thinker so that when you're so you don't stumble accidentally into using them in arguments but also that you can recognize them in other people's um, weak arguments so once again, I'm going to group them into two broad types, inadequate reasons and fallacies that actively mislead, which is just sort of how is my sort of shorthand way of remembering what kind of fallacy this is. There are some that are more serious, some that are more intentional, and we're going to cover those seconds. And so what makes a fallacy a fallacy is essentially it makes an argument have the veneer, sort of the appearance of being logical, the appearance of being a good, well-supported argument, and in reality, the person has very weak reasons. Their reasons do not adequately support their arguments, or their reasons have no business being in any argument. It's sort of like form but no substance. They ask the question, issue, they give you some reasons that sound maybe sort of good and they come up with a conclusion and because they've constructed an issue reasons and conclusion style argument you start thinking this person has a well supported well reasoned point of view and in reality they are fallacious and so the first fallacy I want to teach you is called a faulty analogy on slide five um, essentially a faulty analogy is when you make a comparison between two things right and you say this thing is like this thing but the core comparison isn't relevant to the argument right that's the idea a false or weak analogy is when you compare two things as if the fact that you can make that comparison and say a is like b somehow supports the conclusion and in reality it doesn't right because the relevant way that these two things are similar has nothing to do with the argument at hand right and that's what makes for a weak or faulty analogy right um, and so let's so let's so think about it this way um, and so think about it this way let me, let me give you an example because I think an example is better than trying to re-explain it again here's an example of what's called a weak or faulty analogy on slide six guns are like hammers they're both tools with metal parts that can be used to kill someone so clearly an analogy has been made here. A, a gun is being compared to a hammer in that they are both metal, they're both tools, and they could theoretically be used to kill someone. So you've drawn three comparisons in, in, in this analogy and say how the, here are three ways that these things are, are, are similar. Um, and so, but then hear this person's conclusion. So even though guns are like hammers, both tools, both metal, both could theoretically be used to kill someone, we we it is ridiculous uh, we we would consider it to be ridiculous to restrict the purchase of hammers so therefore no restrictions on uh so restrictions on guns would be equally ridiculous right and so here is why this is weak uh here is why this is weak think about it you can compare any two things right you can compare any two things um and essentially say that there's a reason why then these two things should be treated the same in, in every way but ju but in order for the comparison between guns and hammers to be not weak in order for that analogy to actually support the conclusion the similarities between guns and hammers would actually have to be relevant to the conclusion which is the idea of when and under what circumstances guns should be prohibited or or hammers should be prohibited right they're using the idea that they're made of metal to support the idea about banning them. And that would only be true if the fact that they're metal is a reason that we ban guns. And of course, that's not a reason why we have any restrictions on guns or 
banning guns in general, right? In some places they're banned, but whatever. Let's just use the U.S. model, which is to restrict them, restrict their purchase. So that comparison, the idea that guns and hammers are both made of metal, is simply not relevant to the idea that we restrict gun use. We don't restrict gun use because they're made out of metal. Let's so go to the second thing. Well, they're both tools. Again, we don't restrict gun use because they're tools. So again, that, that comparison is completely irrelevant to the conclusion. And then the last one. They could theoretically be used to kill someone. Hmm. Now, is that relevant? Is the fact that a gun could theoretically be used to kill someone the reason why we restrict their use? And it's not. Anything could theoretically be used to kill someone. I could use dental floss to kill someone. I could use a candlestick theoretically to, to kill someone. My, right, uh, I could use um, any big heavy object to theoretically kill someone. Right? We don't restrict gun use because it, they could theoretically kill people. It's because of the capacity for death, the reason that they're, they're restricted. It's the fact that they can kill someone, a large number of people, at a distance in a relatively quick time period. Right? Now, I'm not saying whether or not, now I'm not weighing in here as uh, on whether or not guns should be restricted. Maybe there are gun, good reasons for which you think or a person might think gun should not be restricted. But this analogy isn't a good support for that, that conclusion. Because the three things that you have said, guns are similar to hammers, they're made of metal, they're tools, and they could theoretically be used to kill someone, are not the reasons we restrict guns. So. It is a faulty analogy. It's simply a faulty analogy. Now, here's an example of a good analogy, arguably. Um, uh, and, uh, is, so maybe you say, um, hey, uh, um, alcohol, um, alcohol um, is a mind-altering substance. It um, has a high potency for addiction. Um, and marijuana is also um, a mind-altering substance and has a has a potential for addiction. Um, and yet we don't we we don't make alcohol illegal, and yet we make marijuana illegal, right? This would actually be a good analogy to support either the prohibition of alcohol or the increased legalization of marijuana. Now, again, I'm not suggesting we ought to legalize marijuana or prohibit alcohol use. I'm only suggesting that this would not be a faulty analogy because the idea that both are mind-altering substances and the fact that both have a capacity for addiction are relevant to why we prohibit or at least restrict one's use. And, it, and so it, that would be a not a faulty analogy. And that's how you know a good analogy from a bad one. Does the comparison of interest, the fact that, is that actually relevant to the conclusion? If it's not, it's a faulty or weak analogy. So moving on to slide seven, another fallacy. Um, this one is called missing the point. Missing the point. It's also called circular uh, missing the point. Uh, and, and that's what it's called. And what missing the point is, um, is is essentially going to be where a person set up a pretty sets up a pretty fantastic argument for something, but then doesn't actually make the conclusion that supports the argument that they made. They slightly miss the point. So here's an example. Um, uh, the seriousness of the punishment should match the seriousness of a crime. Right now, the punishment for drunk driving may simply be a fine, but drunk driving is a very serious crime that can kill innocent people. So, now ready for it, the death penalty should be used as the punishment for drunk driving. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here, hold up here, son. Uh, you need to slow your roll, is what I would say to this person. They've actually set up a pretty good argument for a particular conclusion. The idea that the seriousness of the crime of drunk driving should, should match the consequence, right? They've set up a great argument that the current, the current, the current punishment is inadequate, just a fine. But they have not actually supported the idea that, that the death penalty should be used. They've like led, led you from point A to point B to point C, set you up for maybe a conclusion that you need to increase the penalty for drunk driving, but then they've jumped to this pretty radical place that, that the death penalty needs to be used. And that just misses the point. You haven't actually directly addressed the conclusion you want to make. You've argued for a related point and not for the point you actually made. That's the idea, right? And so in slide eight, 
to sort of uh, to sort of further discuss this. Um, the argument here about the death penalty of drunk driving is actually not a terrible argument, but it sets itself up for a variety of conclusions, but not the one it actually made, right? It's really uh, uh, setting itself up for the, the punishment for drunk driving should in fact be more serious, but not that it should be the death penalty, right? They haven't addressed the death penalty component at all. They've just sort of set up an argument that they don't fully support, and that is called missing the point. Another fallacy, in slide nine is called um, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, or a synonym for that would be called false cause. Now post hoc ergo proctor hoc is actually Latin for after this, therefore because of this. And if you've taken any other psychology classes, you may have actually, in fact, you've heard this phrase from me. Correlation does not equal causation. And this is what false cause or post hoc reasoning is as a fallacy. It's assuming just because something goes together in time, kind of like a correlation, then what, there must be a causal relationship. And we know from our discussion from research methodology, just because two things go together in time, just because A, a came before B, doesn't necessarily mean A caused B, right? We, uh, for example, it being hot out, right, is what leads to increased ice cream sales and increased um, homicides, right? And so if you notice that the ice cream sales were going up, and then you also notice that the homicide rates were going up, you might, in a false cause, post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, say, well, those ice cream sales must have caused those increases in homicide rates, and that's just fallacious. Just because something comes before something else in time doesn't mean there's a cause and effect relationship. And there, this is a, a, a lot of how superstitions come about, right? This idea that um, I broke a mirror and then something bad happened to me, so it must have been the broken mirror's fault that I, um, that I got uh, bad luck, that something bad happened to me. Um, and that's just false cause reasoning, post hoc ergo proctor hoc. And so let's think of, uh, let's, uh, let's think of a, an example. Pres uh, on slide um, 10. President Jones raised taxes and then the rate of violent crime went up. Jones is responsible for the rise in violent crime, which is just post hoc ergo propter hoc reasoning. And you actually see this a lot in politics. Um, and you see it from both sides of uh, with both liberals and conservatives. For example, um, when Barack Obama got elected, um, for a while the, the gas rates went up, right? And so, oh no, before Barack Obama, we had cheap gas, and now we have expensive gas. Oh my goodness, Barack Obama is, is terrible. He caused the gas prices to go up. That would be fallacious. But now over time, gas prices have actually gone down a lot in the last few years. And Barack Obama is no more responsible for that than he was for the gas prices to go up. And for people to, for, to claim credit for him, that he's the reason why gas prices have now gone down, is equally fallacious. You have to establish a cause and effect relationship using good experimentation. You can't just say A came before B, so then A caused B, right? That's, it's fallacious reasoning to think that that is true. Remember, correlation is not the same thing as causation. Moving on to slide 11, another, yet another fallacy is something called a slippery slope. Now a slippery slope is um, sort of extreme thinking and it's fallacious because it essentially assumes that once one tiny little event has happened, then this other really extreme outcome is definitely going to occur. That is the idea behind a slippery slope. And it's fallacious reasoning to say, just because this small event happened, this huge event is gonna happen. And it's actually a, a, a synonym for that is called the camel's nose because of the shape of a camel's nose. This idea of a slippery slope, that once you start walking down the path um, on a, for a particular outcome, that this really extreme things are about to, to occur. It's a bit, essentially extreme chain reaction style reasoning without actually supporting the necessary step from step A to step B to step three to, to A, from A to B to C to D or step one to two to three to four. It's this idea that you can't sort of stop in the middle of some chain reaction when you, when you can most of the time in life. And so let me give you a couple examples of this. Uh, slide 12. Killing ants reduces our respect for life. If we don't respect life, we're likely to be more and more tolerant of violent acts like war and murder. Wait, what? 
Soon our society will become a battlefield in which everyone constantly fears for their lives. It will be the end of civilization as we know it. Okay. To prevent this terrible consequence, we should make killing ants illegal right now. Whoa! You need to calm down, right? Just because killing ants is perfectly legal doesn't in fact necessarily mean we're going to have less respect for life. And even if that was true, even if people who kill ants don't have as much respect for life as people who are careful never to kill ants, that doesn't actually mean we're going to start tolerating war and murder. And, and even if we were going to start tolerating war and murder, well, there are still wars and murders, and it's not the end of civilization as we know it. It's like this person has taken this one small thing, the idea that pesticides are legal, and created this big, giant catastrophe as a result, right? It's just, it's just, it's fallacious thinking. It's called a slippery slope. So catastrophizing, right? If you know any drama queens in your life, when they catastrophize, one tiny little thing happens. Oh no, I didn't turn in my first quiz. That means I'm going to get a terrible grade on my quizzes and I'm not going to do well in the exam. And then because I don't, don't do well in the exam, I'm going to fail the course. And because I fail the course, I'm going to drop out of college. And because I drop out of college, I'm going to live homeless on the street. Whoa, you just missed a quiz. That is a slippery slope. You need to calm down. Just because you missed a quiz doesn't mean you're going to fail the exam, right? So that's what the idea behind catastrophizing. But you can actually have slippery slopes in the positive direction as well. Imagine uh, our, our, our same drama queen. She, she, uh, he meets some beautiful girl, right? And, he, and she smiles at him. And he starts saying, oh my God, that girl, she smiled at me. I'm totally going to ask her out. And she is going to say yes. And we are going to go to on, on, a, on an amazing series of dates, and then we're going to get married, and and then we're going to have ten kids, and we're going to grow old together, and it's going to be awesome. Ooh, take a breath, take a breath, right? It's the same slippery slope. It's this idea of extreme chain reaction thinking is fallacious slippery slope thinking. Just because one event happens and A leads to B doesn't mean B is going to lead to C and doesn't mean that C is going to lead to D, right? Sometimes slippery, slippery slopes happen, but just suggesting that the small event happens, therefore these other really extreme things are definitely going to happen is totally fallacious. Another fallacy is called a hasty conclusion or uh, a, uh, a hasty generalization. And this is fallacious because uh, when a person does this, they essentially uh, make one or two observations about the world and then come up with a, a conclusion based on only those one or two observations without waiting to see if further observation might have given them more, more or different evidence. So hasty means too fast, right? And so hasty means a hasty conclusion or a hasty generalization is where you make one observation about the world or two observations about the world and suddenly you say, Eureka, this is the way the world must be and the way it always must be. And that's just too fast. It's too hasty. You need to make more observations, right? And so that's what makes this unique, this particular fallacy unique. It's about making one or two observations and then assuming the way that those one or two observations fell out is the way that all things must be. And this is really common in stereotyping, right? Maybe we interact with one person from a particular group and then we assume that our interaction with that person is indicative of everyone um, uh, in that group. Or if we make a, or if we go to a restaurant and we have a bad experience at that restaurant, we assume that at that restaurant must be horrible. And anytime you go to that restaurant, it's going to be equally awful when you go there. It'd be a hasty conclusion, right? So, and so keep that in mind. So here's an, another example uh, of a hasty conclusion on slide 14. My roommate said her philosophy class was hard, and when I'm in is hard. So therefore, all philosophy classes must be hard. Well, only two classes out of the dozens and dozens and dozens of different philosophy classes that one could take? Hmm, that's probably a hasty conclusion. You probably should make more observations before you come to that conclusion. So moving on to slide 15. Another fallacy. This one is called begging the question. It's also called a tautology. T-A-U T tall oh yeah T A U T I have to write it down T A U T T 
tautology. I think it's T-A-U-T-A-L-O-G-Y, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not a very good speller. Any case, it's begging the question or tautology, often called circular reasoning. And this is the kind of a fallacious thinking where somebody asks a question, so you have an issue, they rephrase the question with different words so they don't actually give you a new reason. They actually give you no new information. They just say the same thing again and then call their argument done. That is called begging the question because when a person does this, it, uh, in, in this fallacious way, in this fallacy driven way, they make it, they state a question, use synonyms for that question as if they've given you in, new information, which leads you to go, wait, 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 you didn't actually support your point of view. So you're begging them to give you more information. So here's an example, uh, 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 here's an example of that, right, um, on slide 16. Um, active euthanasia is morally acceptable. And you're like, Okay, that's the person's conclusion. So I guess their issue must be, should euthanasia, uh, is euthanasia a morally acceptable thing? Is euthanasia a morally acceptable thing? And they say, yes, the act of euthanasia is morally acceptable. And you go, okay, why? Well, because it's decent and ethical to help another human being escape suffering through death. Wait, what? You just said the same thing twice, right? If you think about it, if you lay it out in that formal way, um, it is a decent ethical thing to help another human being escape suffering through death. Therefore, active euthanasia is morally acceptable. You can sort of recognize that they've just said the same thing twice. Dec decent and ethical is the same thing as morally acceptable, essentially, right? Our, moral, our morals drive our ethics. And helping someone escape suffering through death is the definition of active euthanasia. So all you've done is define your terms here. You haven't actually provided any reasons for why you think this is a decent ethical thing, right? Okay, great. It is a decent ethical thing for another human being to escape suffering through death. That is your point of view. Now, but I need more. I need you to tell me more. All you've done is beg the question. All you've done is gone in a big circle. You've So why is active euthanasia okay? Well, because it's decent and ethical to, to help someone escape suffering through death. Well, why is it decent and ethical to help, so help someone escape suffering through death? Well, because euthanasia is morally acceptable. But why is euthanasia morally acceptable? Well, because it's decent and ethical to escape, right? See how it's a big circle. You're not actually supporting any uh, the point of view with new reasons. Or well, here's another one, right? Um, uh, you know, why is, you know, why is, why is uh, John a jerk? Well, John's a jerk because he's kind of a creep. But why is he a creep? Well, because he's kind of a jerk. But why is he a jerk? Well, because he's kind of a creep. Right? You're, not, you're saying the same thing twice. You're not giving any new information. And that is called begging the question. Or a tautology. Tautology. I think it's T-A-U-T-A-L-O-G-Y. I, I believe. Or circular reasoning. Synonyms for the same idea. No new information. Moving on to slide 17. Uh, another fallacy is called the false dilemma. And this one often gets confused by students with the false with the with the false analogy. The false analogy though is making a comparison, saying A is like B, these two things are similar. And therefore some conclusion that has nothing to do with the, with the with the fact that they're similar. A false dilemma is fallacious reasoning where somebody gives you a choice. They can say you can have A or you can have B. As if those are the only two choices, right? That is a false dilemma or a false choice or sometimes called a false dichotomy. D-I-C-H, dicha, D-I-C-H-A-T-O-M-Y. False dichotomy, which means two things, right? So you've got the false choice, false dilemma, or false dichotomy where someone gives you a choice between A and B and in reality, there are choices C and D and E and F but they're not giving you those choices as if they're a thing, right? And so it's a false choice. And it leads to really simplistic thinking and it leads to fallacious reasoning because what if choices C or D or E, which the person who arguing hasn't even presented you with, um, would in fact be the better solution, right? So let's look at an example. Let's look at an example of this, um, uh, right? Uh, or, or uh, in, in slide 19. Caldwell Hall is in bad shape. Either we tear it down and put up a new building or we continue to risk 
all the students' safety. Obviously, we shouldn't risk everyone's safety, so we must tear down the building. Now, this isn't a slippery slope either, because there's not like this idea that, oh, you know, there's a broken light socket at Caldwell Hall, so because of the broken light socket, it's going to cause an electrical short in the building, which is going to then set the place on fire, and because it's set on fire, the whole the university is going to be, that's a slippery slope. This is just a false dilemma, because they're basically asserting something is true. Caldwell Hall is in bad shape. Okay, so let's say you, you admit that it is. This building at this, at this college is, is run down. And then they give you this choice. Either you tear it down and put up a new building, or the student's safety is going to be compromised. Okay, right? So these are the only two choices. Tear it down, tear it down, or leave it up, and then everyone is going to be unsafe. See how there's only two choices here? And the person argues in this statement as if those are the only two choices. But think about it. Couldn't there be other options? Like, do we have to tear it down? Could we renovate it? Could we close down the rooms that are, that are in worse shape and keep holding classes in the rooms that are in better shape? Are there other options? Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. But this arguer isn't even addressing those possible other options, right? And so it becomes a false choice or a false dilemma. And I actually do this a lot. Uh, I actually engage in this fallacious reasoning a lot with my child. I have a six-year-old son. And I actually uh, engage in fallacious thinking with him a lot. Um, but I do it on purpose. Um, and I, I, I'm worried about the day that he's gonna, uh, uh, that he's gonna know the name of this fallacy. Although he's often pretty good now, even at calling me on it. Because here's what I do. I say, Finn, would you like broccoli or carrots? And he's like, because these are your two choices for food right now. And he goes, I want cake. <laughs> right? He's like, Mom, there are, other, there are other food choices in the world right now. And I would like those food choices. You're only giving me two. And I know there are other choices. Right? And so my son calls me on my false choice, false dichotomy, false dilemma fallacy. Right? But it works, or at least it used to when he was younger. Right? Give you two choices as if they're the only two choices and make you pick. That if there are in fact other options, that is a false dilemma. If there are only two options, well then it's not a false dilemma, right? That's the idea. It's a false choice or a false dilemma if there are third, fourth, and fifth options that the arguer isn't admitting to. And so that is our first sort of group of fallacies that I call the fallacies that uh, are just sort of inadequate. Um, and these are sort of the fallacies that are also often more likely to be accidental. They're more likely to be unintentional, but you still got to point them out to people and you still have to be careful not to engage in these fallacies yourself. All right. <clears throat> and so that leads us to our... <clears throat> oh, let me shut the door. Sorry. All right. So that leads us to our second group of fallacies which are fallacies that I would argue are much more likely to be actively deceptive and misleading to the listener, to the, to the person who's listening to the argument. And so we're on slide 20. And so these are the things, these are the type of fallacies where the reasons that the, the arguer provides really have no business being in the argument. Meaning it's not that you could just sort of fix the argument if you just improved on the reasons, added more reasons or connected the dots better, Rather, these are reasons that someone would give you in an argument that have no business being there. Never support an argument. They're just bad reasons. And the first one on side 21 is called a red herring. And a red herring is something that someone puts in an argument that is simply distracting. That's what it is. And it's called a red herring because it actually comes from the idea that if you put a fish across the pathway of a dog that's on a hunt for something, like you on a hunt for truth, the herring, the fish smell would distract the listener, right? And so um, let's let's take my son for as an example, right? Like let's say my son has got has got a stick and he's whacking at the dog with the stick, right? And I say, Finn, put down the stick, and he goes, it's not a stick, it's a laser beam. Great, that is so cute, you, but you're just trying to distract me, right? And that's the idea behind a red herring. It's simply there to distract the listener, right? Or, hey, no running in the house, and you say, I, 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 or, or, and, or and, your, and your child says, um, I'm not running. I, I am engaged in an undersea battle. 
that is so cute, right? That that that's that. But it's 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 simply a distraction, and so whenever somebody just simply distracts you, it's it's a red herring. So uh, let's look at another example of this on slide 22. Grading this exam on a curve would be the most fair thing to do. After all, classes go more smoothly when students get and their professors are getting along well. Wait, wait, what? Let's just re, let's just lay this out in with issue re, uh, reasons and and conclusion issue. Should we grade the exam on a curve? Premise: Classes go more smoothly when the students and the professor get along well. So therefore, grading on the exam on the curve would be the most fair thing to do. Wait, what? What, what, what does that have to do with anything? How does professors and students getting along have anything at all to do with grading on a curve? It's simply there as a distraction, right? To be actively misleading the person away from the relevant issue, right? Because you start thinking to yourself, Oh yeah, I think it's important that it, that professors and students get along, right? And so, okay, so maybe then that conclusion must be true too. When in reality, that reason, the idea of students and professors getting along, has literally nothing to do at all with the conclusion of grading the exam on a curve. It's simply a red herring. Slide 23, another fallacy. This is a, a, a fallacy that actively mislead and leads and has no business um, in an argument. And because that was true of the red herring as well. You don't want to put statements in your argument that are simply distracting, that are emotional, that are evocative. And that's actually one of the most common form of a red herring, is someone will put something in an argument that is just an emotional thing to say that has nothing to do with the central issue. And because that statement evo evokes a lot of emotion, brings up a lot of emotion for people, then they, um, it sort of distracts them from the issue at hand. Now the straw man is also um, a, a fallacy that's often used purposefully to mislead. And this is where essentially when the person uh, is making their argument, they distort the other point of view. It's called a straw man argument. Because what you do is if someone happens to disagree with your point of view, you pretend that that person's disagreement is based on a really bad argument. You create a pretend counter argument to your own that then you can easily attack, right? As opposed to actually addressing the, the, the real person's point, the, the person's real point of view. So let's look at an example of a straw man, which is again to distort or exaggerate the other the other side of the argument, make it seem worse than it is in order for you to attack that distorted argument instead of the real one that might be more difficult for you to challenge. Feminists want to ban all pornography and punish everyone who reads all of it, but such harsh measures are surely inappropriate, so feminists are wrong. Porn and its readers should be left in peace. Now there are feminist arguments that critique pornography. I'm not going to weigh in on those right now. Um, uh, uh, but the idea that feminists want to ban all pornography in all of its form and anyone who reads pornography they want to throw them in jail is not actually what I really I've really never read any feminist feminist literature that suggests they want to ban all pornography and anyone who reads pornography or watches pornography should be severely punished yeah I've actually um, never read something that says that and so that's a straw man you're pretending that the other side's argument is worse than it is because then you can attack that false distorted argument um, as a straw man and just think of it this way what's easier to fight a real person or a scarecrow well, a scarecrow is easier to fight. And it's the same thing with argumentation. What's easier to argue against? The person's real point of view or what you say their point of view is, but in his reality is just distorted. Straw man. Another fallacy that has no business being in an argument is called an ad hominem attack. And it's essentially where instead of dis discussing the person, the, the other side's point of view, instead of addressing the actual core issues, instead of using issues, reasons, conclusions about the actual relevant topic, you simply attack the other side. You, you attack the other person's character, you attack the other person as an individual as a, instead of addressing his or her reasons. It's called an ad hominem attack, which is again comes from Latin, of the person, uh, ad hominem, um, homo sapien, right? Ad hominem, of the person. And it's always inappropriate. Right, um, and so here's some examples of uh, of ad hominems. Like Thomas Jefferson was called anti-American. 
right? Instead of discussing uh, Thomas Jefferson's policies, instead of discussing his ideas and trying to deconstruct those ideas, you simply call him anti-American, or John Adams is a fool, or when someone calls you a calls you a bleeding heart liberal or a heartless conservative, or even when you say, "Hey, you're just a liar." Unless you actually address the person's point of view, meaning address the reasons that they gave you, it's an ad hominem attack and it's simply not appropriate in a good, well-reasoned argument. Don't focus on the speaker. You need to focus on the speaker's ideas. Deconstruct the, the, the person's ideas, right? And so let's say um, there's a particular politician and you think he's dishonest and you think he's a megalomaniac and you, you think he's racist and let's say you think he's just a horrible human being, right? All of those things are ad hominem attacks, right? You're, you're focused on the speaker. What you should do, theoretically, with this politician is you need to focus on the actual things that were said. So-and-so said this. Um, this statement is inaccurate or this statement is wrong because of X, Y, Z and, 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 and further and for, foremost, right? You need to act in a good, well-reasoned argument. You don't attack the person. You attack those person's ideas, right? Or you, you address the person's ideas and you deconstruct those ideas and point out how they're flawed or inaccurate or, um, or inappropriate or immoral. Um, anytime you attack the person and not that person's, uh, and, and don't address the person's thoughts or ideas, you've engaged in an ad hominem attack and it has no place in a good, well-reasoned argument. Slide 25, another fallacy, is called ad populum. And this also comes from the Latin. And it essentially is an argument that basically says everyone's doing it, so we should do it too. That is an ad populum fallacy, right? And just because everyone is doing something uh, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do because everyone could have been doing it wrong for forever. Right, and so the idea of, of keeping up with the Kardashians or, or wanting to be with the in crowd, wanting to do the most popular thing is fallacious and that's called um, ad populum. Slide 26 is appeal to traditions. Um, uh, and this is the idea, it's very similar to ad populum. Ad populum is everyone's doing it, but everyone could, be do, could have been doing it wrong. So just pointing out that everyone is doing it is not a good argument. Appeal to traditions is to say um, everyone is, people have done it this way forever, and because we've done it this way forever, we should keep doing it this way. And so that's why it's an appeal to tradition, and it's fallacious. Because just because society or a group of people or a family or a person has always done something in a particular way doesn't mean it's the right way of doing it. It's, that's completely fallacious, right? And so anytime someone says, well, I believe we should do it this way because this is the way it's always been done, that's a fallacy. What would make it not fallacious, either in the ad populum example or in the appeal to traditions example, is to start talking about the reasons why lots of people do it. So let's use like a car example. You know, this is the number one most popular car is, is fallacious. The fact that it's popular, who cares? In terms of a good, well-reasoned argument to buy a car. But pointing out that people buy this car because uh, it's highly fuel efficient, because it's really fun to drive, those start becoming good, non-fallacious reasons for your argument. The same thing with appeal to traditions. To simply say, well, we've always done it this way is a fallacy. But then to say, well, people have always done it this way because, let's say we've always bought Toyotas because in our family, because everyone in our family likes how reliable they are, everyone in our family likes how, uh, economically priced they are, now you start having non-fallacious reasons for buying a particular car. But simply saying everyone is doing it, ad populum, or saying it's always been done this way, appeal to traditions, are both fallacious and they don't have a place in a good, well-reasoned argument. Another fallacy is called an appeal to authority, starting on slide 27. And an appeal to an authority is essentially where you argue that a person should believe you because someone in charge says so. Or your point of view is the correct one simply because someone in charge says so. That's an appeal to an authority. And it's just fallacious, but it's kind of a tough one to think about the fallacy nature of this. 
Because what don't we want our ideas to come from good authority figures? For example, the authority of science. Don't we want our opinions to be informed by people who are in charge and maybe have really good information? Well, here's why it's problematic. It's problematic because the fallacy comes in when you don't actually give the reasons behind doing it. When you simply say the person in charge thinks we ought to do this, so we ought to do this. Or the person uh, uh, is in a position of authority, so we should believe him. That is not a good argument. Now what would be a good argument using authority is to say, look, I'm about to give you some real reasons for doing something. And these ideas came from an authority figure, which is why you should believe these actual reasons. But you need the reasons, otherwise it's fallacious. So let's say I tell you, hey, my doctor says you need to limit, um, you limit salt intake. Well, that's a fallacy. To simply appeal to the authority of my doctor and to suggest that I should lower my salt intake is, 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 is fallacious. It's, it's what's called an appeal to authority. What you need to do is say, hey, my doctor, he's a medical doctor, he's, he's an expert in the medical sciences, said I should um, uh, reduce my salt intake and here are the reasons why my doctor told me to do this. Uh, because uh, eating salt, uh, research shows, can increase blood pressure. Uh, increased blood pressure can then lead to greater risk of stroke, right? You actually provide the reasons from the authority figure. Not just say, hey, an authority said it, so I should do it. Because if you do it that way, that has no place in an argument and is fallacious. Right, so here's an example. Um, because there's even a, an even worse appeal to authority fallacy, and it's what's called an appeal to a false authority. And sometimes um, uh, the appeal to authority is, is even worse then. Because sometimes authority figures aren't actually authority figures, right? So here's an example of an appeal to false authority. We should abolish the death penalty. Many respected people, such as actor Guy Handsome, have publicly stated their opposition to it. Uh, all right. Uh, well, even if let's say I had I had said we should abolish the death penalty because uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Ruth Bader Ginsburg is uh, not she's not the Chief Justice sorry but she is she is in fact a justice um, one of the justices on the Supreme Court uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg thinks we should abolish the death penalty so therefore we ought to that is an appeal to authority and that is fallacious. Now if I say, hey, I think we should abolish the death penalty um, and here are some ideas that I got from Ruth Bader Ginsburg who is a Supreme Court Justice. She says X, Y, and Z, right, and she's an expert, that would not be an appeal to an authority, right? This one, we should abolish the death penalty. Many respected people, such as actor Guy Handsome, have publicly stated their opposition to it, is even worse because we're now actually not just appealing to any authority, we're appealing to a false authority, a person who has no business weighing in on this topic in a way that is persuasive, right? The, have you ever heard the old joke, you know, I'm not an actor, but I'll play one on TV, so therefore you should buy this medicine. Such a fallacy, huge fallacy. Not only an appeal to an authority, but an appeal to a false authority, right? That's the idea. Slide 29, uh, appeal to pity. This is the uh, type of fallacy where you try to convince someone uh, to your point of view simply by pulling at their heartstrings. Not actually providing any good reasons, any good logical reasons to support a particular point of view, but simply to make them feel sorry for you. That is called an appeal to, uh, to pity. And so here's an example. Uh, I know the exam is graded based on performance, but you should give me an A. My, my cat has been sick, and my car broke down, and I have a cold, and so it was really hard for me to study, so yeah, mm -hmm. give me an A. Um, no, right? Because though the fact that bad things have happened to you is not a good reason to provide you with a grade in the class. So it's an appeal to pity, right? Don't just make people feel sorry for you in arguments because it doesn't make for a good argument, right? Or how about this? Um, it's wrong to tax corporations. Think of all the money they give to charity and the cost they're earning to paying for their businesses. Um, no. Can't, first of all, you can't make me feel sorry for a big corporation, but even if I could, right? Even if you could, simply pointing out that someone might be disadvantaged by a particular point of view, simply trying to get someone to make you feel sorry for somebody or some entity is a fallacy. Appeal to pity. It's not a good reason to believe anything. Slide 30. Another fallacy. Appeal to ignorance. 
What is an appeal to ignorance? An appeal to ignorance is when you say there's no evidence to support a particular point of view, therefore my point of view must be the right one. No evidence is just that. No evidence doesn't support anything, right? If there's no evidence for something, then there's no evidence and you can't come to a conclusion, right? And so if you suggest that, hey, nobody's been able to prove that no one has been able to prove this or no one has been able to disprove this therefore my point of view is the right one it is called an appeal to ignorance and it's fallacious and it has no business in an argument and so let's use a hot button issue to illustrate what I mean by an appeal to ignorance let's talk about the existence of God most people have an opinion about this and there's some pretty uh, strong disagreement on this particular idea and so let's think about it Right, um, uh, so here would be one example of an appeal to ignorance. People have been trying for centuries to prove that God exists. No one has been able to prove it, so no evidence. Therefore, God must not exist. Um, no, no evidence doesn't prove anything, doesn't disprove anything either, right? Because here is an equally fallacious appeal to ignorance on the other side. People have been trying for years to prove that God doesn't exist. No one has been able to prove that he doesn't, therefore he must. No, sorry. This is, a, again, an appeal to ignorance. Now, whether, whether maybe you have good reason, maybe you're an atheist, and maybe you have very good reasons for why you're an atheist, but I hope appeal to ignorance is not one of those reasons. Saying, hey, no one's been able to prove God exists, therefore he must not exist. Appeal to ignorance. Or maybe you are, have, are, have a strong belief in God, right? And I certainly hope that you don't, but your good reasons for your belief are not an appeal to ignorance. No one's been able to disprove him, therefore he must exist. Equally fallacious, right? Whatever your particular belief is about God, it needs to be based on reasons that are not saying, hey, there's no evidence against my point of view, therefore my point of view must be the right one. Nope, fallacious, appeal to ignorance. The last fallacy, slide 31, is called equivocation. Uh, an equivocation is a sneaky one. It's a sneaky one. And it's almost always used intentionally to mislead the listener, to try to play a fast one with language, to make arguments seem good when they're really crap, right? So here's equivocation. It's when you use one word that sounds like the same word, but if you're using that word in two very different ways to try to pull a fast one manipulatively on a listener, on someone you're trying to convince. And here, and here is an example of that. Giving money is the right thing to do, so charities have the right to our money. Well, that's using the word right in two very different ways, right? We're, in the first statement, giving money is the right thing to do talks about the moral correctness of it how it's like a moral thing to do to give your money to charity, right? And But in the second sentence, instead of using that word in the same way, they, they say, so charities have a right to our money. Well, that's a different usage of that word, right? That's the idea that they have a, um, they have a, uh, um, we have an obligation to give them our money, right? Charities have the right to our money, which means people should be compelled to give because they have the right to it, like the right to life or the right to pursue, to pursue, uh, like 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 the like the Bill of Rights. These are two very different usages of this word. They have a similar root, which is I think why it's easy to equivocate equivocate with them, but it's misleading and it's usually intentionally misleading to use the same word in two different ways to try to sort of pull a fast one on people. Um, it's not cool. It's called equivocation and it is fallacious. And so those, again, a lot of fallacies I've shared with you and there are even more I could, I, I could teach you. If you took a formal logic class, like with the philosophy department, you'd probably learn about more of them. But these are some of the really common ones the ones that are the most likely to be used in advertising or the most likely to, for you to stumble into accidentally as a reasoner. And so these are the ones that I want you to know. And what I see in your future is um, uh, me giving you some fallacies where you have to identify which fallacy it is. Um, and so what I provided you with in the, in, the, in, the rest, in the rest of the lecture notes 
in the, in the rest of the lecture PowerPoint notes are essentially some fallacies where they're examples of the kind of fallacies I might give you, let's say on an exam, and you have to figure out what fallacy it is, right? So let's go through them together. Slide 32. It is ridiculous to have spent thousands of dollars to rescue those two whales trapped in the Arctic ice. Why, look at all the people trapped in jobs they don't like. Hmm, what is going on here? Well, sometimes students say equivocation because traps trapped, right? But be, tra being trapped is being used in the same way, right? They're trapped in the ice and you're trapped in your job. That's, that's the same way, okay. Sometimes students say false analogy, but are you saying these two things are the same? Not really. What's really going on here is a red herring, right? It's ridiculous to spend thousands of dollars to rescue those two whales trapped in the ice. Hey, look at the people trapped in their jobs. You're simply trying to distract the person, right? So that is a red herring. Slide 33. Plagiarism is deceitful because it is dishonest. Now what's really going on here? Hmm. Plagiarism is deceitful because it is dishonest. Well, this is begging the question, right? You've just said the same thing twice. It's deceitful because it's dishonest. Well, why is it deceitful? Well, because it's dishonest. Well, why is it dishonest? Well, because it's deceitful, right? You're just saying the same thing twice. Number three. Water, uh, on slide 34. Water fluoridation affects the brain. Citywide, students' test scores have begun to drop five months after fluoridation began. So A came before B, therefore A must cause B. Fluoridation came before the test scores drop, therefore the fluoridation must cause the test score drop. That's going to be false cause, right? And so uh, what I want you to do is I want you to then go through the rest of these slides and see if you can detect which are, which are the, what, what the name of the fallacy is, right? Um, if you make the, the lecture notes full screen, you can actually sort of test yourself um, on each of these because the answers come up after, right? Um, but let's do a couple more. Let's do a couple more. Uh, slide 35. I know three redheads who have terrible tempers, and since Annabelle has red hair, I bet she has a terrible temper too. Well, this is going to be a hasty generalization. Three redheads do not an entire population of bad-tempered redheads make, right? You're making your, your conclusion too quickly, right? Hasty generalization. Slide 36. The painting is trash because it's in the waste bin. Well, what's that? Well, that's going to be circular reasoning again. Tautology, begging the question. Because why is the painting in the trash? Because it's in the waste bin. Well, why is it in the waste bin? Because the painting is trash. Well, why is it in the trash? Because it's in the waste bin, right? You go around and around in circles. Slide 37. You support capital punishment just because you're evil and mean and want an eye for an eye. You're a person with no compassion at all. Well, that certainly sounds like you're distorting the other person's point of view, right? Just because someone supports capital punishment doesn't mean that they're a person who lacks compassion and wants eye for an eye and is just a horrible human being. That's a straw man. Slide 38. The meteorolo meteorologist predicted the wrong amount of rain for May. Obviously, that meteorologist cannot be trusted. This person appears to be making a conclusion based on a single thing. That sounds like a hasty conclusion or a hasty generalization to me. So I'll leave the last one, two, three, four, five, six, six to you. See if you can test yourself. See if you can detect what each of those fallacies are um, and see if you can get them right. And when you see the right answer, um, ask your, uh, and you're confused about why the answer is the right answer, feel free to ask me or in the forum below uh, uh, why that was the right answer. All right, thanks a lot, critical thinkers. I will see you next time.